We've been doing a series on kindness. Been talking about kindness and and um, walking through some of the precepts and that God has for us. I want you to recognize a uh, principle of the kingdom, and I'm just going to walk through some. And is that if you got something in your experience, your te- your current experience. Remember, this is we're having a temporary experience here in the earth suit that lasts maybe 100 plus years, and then then that experience is over. And then then what God has determined steps back into place. So we enjoy this and celebrate it and have a good time and eat good food and whatever it is that, that you do. But this is not the whole experience. This is a partial experience. All right. The good news is, you know, when you exit this experience, you get into a place where the experience is so much greater. And God honors you for your faithfulness. And here's a here's a reality of the kingdom. That Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a um, mustard seed, which is the least of all the seeds that when it is planted it becomes a tree where the birds of the air co- come and nest in. Now listen, here's that principle. Things start small and grow big. Things start small in the kingdom. Things start small and grow big. So a little bit can produce a lot. You see that principle all the time. You live that principle. Um, it's a principle that happens with your children. You have a, you have a child that's not 6'8". Could you imagine a woman having a child and the baby comes out and is 6'8". We'll have no kids. She'd be like, no, nah, cuz. You know, that little baby comes out like this. And you're like, oh. And then you're hugging and kissing and doing all that kind of stuff. And that baby has to grow. Has to grow. And it grows and grows and grows and grows. That's the principle of the kingdom. This hasn't changed. You're walking with God and you should be growing. And growing and growing and growing. And then at some point in time, you're growing into the full measure of Christ Jesus. So that you look like Jesus. You talk like Jesus, you act like Jesus, you give like Jesus gives, you serve like Jesus serves, you sacrifice like Jesus, but you also have the victory like Jesus. Jesus gave us, has given us his victory. You should have a measure of victory and be the voice and stop saying things that are not, that are counterproductive or not, not good for you to be the voice and say those things so that you're coming back and saying, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't really mean that, or I was just joking. Do you know that there are angels that live in your house that don't know when you're joking? They're just executing orders because they are under authority. They're not rebellious. They're faithful. And, the, and you say, well, I'm, who am I? You're the one that carries the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God dwells within you. It's in you. And, and sometimes you're growing and maturing so that they recognize who you are because God has given you a little rank in the kingdom. Then once you get rank in the kingdom, unless he takes the rank from you, you are that rank. So you need to learn how to control what you're saying and what you're doing so that you're a reflection of Yeshua. And he can honor you as his reflection because you're not just driven by more stuff for me. Me, 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 give me more. Give me, 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 give me, give me. Give me a new house. Give me a new car. Give me, 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 me. And God is at some point in time says, okay, how much more? When can it stop being about you and really be about the things I've called you to do? If you don't believe that, look at Jesus, who was born a babe, and he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And then when he, his mom asked him to turn the water into wine, and he, 
and he did it because she asked. You know, he didn't come up with that. He didn't say, I'm going to show who I am and turn this water to wine. He didn't. She knew who he was already. She came to him and said, hey, hey, they ran out of wine. He said, what's that have to do with me? But it's his mother asking. And she was a voice. So he did it. But once he did it, the cover was off. And then for three years, man, he's selecting guys. And listen, let me just tell you something about Jesus. He didn't, co- he didn't select them based on who they were. He selected them based on who they were going to be. So sometimes when you, you're evaluating the selection process and God's calling you, and then you're measuring now all the reasons why you can't do it. You can't go. You can't give. You can't serve. And then you're looking at all your, dis, all your mess-ups of the past. And the enemy's good at that. To rewind failure and failure and failure. And he's a liar, man. And you've got to say to yourself, I can do this. I can serve God this way. I can... I can be faithful to my wife. I can, I can bless these children. I can, I, can, I can do the things God has. Come on. At some point in time, you have to make the decision, I can do this. This is going to be okay. Why? Because the Spirit of God is with you, and he's empowering you and calling you to overcome because that's, that's the way God is. And so Jesus grew and, and grew and grew. And, and unlike us, he already knows who he is. But part of Jesus is the son of man. And part of Jesus is the son of God. If you were here Wednesday, Will did a, a great, brought us a great word on David and David's faithfulness and, and how he demonstrated that faithfulness through a young man, Mephibosheth. And who was a descendant of Saul, one of Saul's descendants. And, and, and Saul had, was the guy who was trying to kill David. Every time David turns, there's Saul trying to kill him because he's jealous of David. But David is already established by God and has a voice. And so after Saul dies and David is looking for Mephibosheth, or somebody in Saul's lineage that he can bless because David's a blesser. I think one of the characteristics that Christians ought to have that's a dominant characteristic is you should be a blesser. You, you should find ways to bless other people. Um, get in pursuit of a, being a blesser, a, a kind person, a uh, one who is the difference maker for somebody else who can't make the difference for themselves, right? If you've got trouble in your environment, it's just because the Lord's given you practice. He's giving you practice. Well, I've been struggling with so-and-so. Good, practice, man. Practice being kind. Pra- practice let that go. Uh, practice forgiving. Pr- practice mercy. You won't, you won't get practice in a, in a pristine, perfect environment. You get practice in a crazy environment. And so if you need a lot of practice, you got a lot of crazy. <laughs> practice. So David finds Mephibosheth. And, and he tells him in verse 7 of 2 Samuel 9, Don't be afraid, since I intend to show kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. Um, it was an elevation. God elevated it. You need, need to listen to the whole message. Listen to the, the midweek on Wednesday that Will and Mr. did. It was a powerful word. We should be like that. When you get to the place you have a great voice, use your voice to be the difference for other people. And encourage him. David s- sought him. Now watch this. David s- seeks him, finds him. Mephibosheth, all he's ever experienced in his life is trouble. 
because he was dropped when he was a baby. Accidents happened. But he was lame, and they didn't have any of the technology that we have now. So his life was just doomed with failure. And he's, when David is searching for him and he finds him, he's in a place called, what is it, Lodabar? Which means pastureless. How, how, how can you live in, in an environment as a farmer and not have a pasture, a field? It means you don't have anything. You got nothing. What are you, a farmer? Where's your farm? I don't have one. I've got nothing. What are you going to do tomorrow with what I have? I have nothing. So he, he has nothing. And then he finds the king is pursuing him. And he thinks in his mind that the king is pursuing him because I've done something wrong. And really the king is pursuing him because somebody in his family has done something right. And he's going to bless him. David's an extraordinary leader, but he's not perfect. He makes mistakes like everybody else. Sometimes when you're looking at yourself, you think you disqualify yourself as a leader because of your failures. Stop it. Stop it. Shut up, Satan. You're a liar. Stop it. God's not qualifying you based on your failures. He's qualifying you based on your, his successes in you. It's not just you. It's him in you. David, David uh, he's the king and he's rolling good and the kingdom's been established and Saul's been trying to kill him and he can and and then as years pass, David is on the rooftop relaxing and having a drink and a smoothie. And uh, he sees Bathsheba bathing, sins for her. And uh, she comes to him and he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And she's married to one of his mighty men, Uriah. And David arranges for Uriah to be killed in battle. So when that, that little morning time is over, David takes Bathsheba and marries her. She gets, she's already pregnant with his child. And then the child is born, and, and God, God deals with him. He says, come here, let's talk. Let's talk. Have a little chat, David. And he walks him through a man that, is, that, had, that had an abundance that took a lamb a little bit from a guy that had virtually nothing. And he just takes virtually. And David is incensed. I mean, he's frustrated. In my kingdom? Are you kidding me? This is, this is wrong. And then Nathan the prophet says, you're the man. You're the guy. This is what you did. And this is, this is you took this little bit that Uriah, and you took his wife and murdered him. And, and then it's, let me just tell you, sometimes, so, sometimes there's stuff that you do and no one really knows, and you, you'll try to kind of bury that thing and slip it over here. Or that's when I was 13 or 7. And you don't ever deal with it. You know, you gotta, I'm just telling you, if you're going to be successful long-term in the kingdom of God, and there's a balance, you have to deal with some of the stuff that you have, have failures in. Mistakes that you've made. I'm not saying you have to do them over and over and over and over again, but you should do something. Handle it. Handle it. Handle your business now. Handle it and get it buried because you're not going to be great in the kingdom of God. You're not going to ascend to the highest places before the king and not have handled some things that are counterproductive to where Jesus has taken you. And you don't have to search deep for it. You don't have to fast for 80 days to find it. It's before your face. You'll remember it. You may have buried it and somebody, angels down there digging that thing up and say, handle it first. Handle it first. Listen, there's a balance in the kingdom. There's a balance. 
You don't want to live this whole life counter to the balance of the kingdom, not doing it God's way, and then exit the earth suit at 97 years old, and then stand before Yeshua and expect him not to bring it up. He's going to bring it up like it was yesterday. And, and at that moment, something that could have been covered and eradicated by the blood of Yeshua, but you didn't handle your business, so now it's got to be dealt with before the judge of heaven and earth who is having judgment time. You need to call on mercy. I'm not sure at that time that he's given judgment, you can call on mercy. Because there's a time, a moment in a judicial system that when the judge is making a decision based on the information that he has, that everybody else is silent. I've looked at this information and I've made my decision. I'm just saying it's too, it's too weighty a moment for us not to have presented all the evidence that adjudicates us and makes us innocent. I'm just saying you should count on the blood of Yeshua. But the blood of Yeshua cannot be applied effectively in rebellion. Won't be, it won't be applied in rebellion. It'll be applied in faithfulness. It will be re applied in times of honor. It'll, it'll, it'll be applied when, in, in forgiveness and in, in repentance. It's applied applicably in those, in those environments. It's just not implied very well in rebellion. So don't rebel and hide. If you're going to rebel, confess. If you got somebody else in rebellion in your world, pray for them. You don't have to attack them because your attack is not going to turn their hearts. Kindness does that. Love does that. Mercy does that. Grace does that. Why am I spending time on this? I'm just giving you some tools here that are important for you to be successful in the kingdom of God and successful in the kingdom of men. So David has a faux pas, but, but uh, Nathan the prophet says, You'll not die, and David tears his clothes. Here's, here's what I love about David. When Nathan the prophet comes before David and tells him, you're the man, that's a scary deal to do because the, the, the king has the power that's unchecked. No one has the power like, king, that, like the king has. So he could says, how dare you come in here and talk to me? And if he does that, then he could be dead. There's times that other kings would say that. Somebody would give him a bad report, and he says, How? And if, and if the Lord wasn't there, David tears his clothes, says, I deserve to die. Because he realizes he's the guy. And then Nathan says, You're not going to die, but there's going to be trouble in your house. And the trouble in your house is going to be a little bit. And, and the baby, oh, yeah, by the baby, that, the baby's going to die too. So he's, he's fasting and crying and praying and weeping and interceding because he knows that God is movable. He's got a soft heart. He can change, right? But, God's, but this is unchangeable. So the baby dies, and, and they recognize they're afraid to tell David that, hey, the baby's died because they think that he's going to lose his mind. And David hears him whispering, and, and he says, is the baby's dead? He said, yeah. Ah. So he gets up and he cleans up and he goes and eats. And people are like, what? 
the baby was alive, you were like hysterical, crying. And, but now that the baby's dead, you're up eating. He says, listen, I can't go back. I can't bring the baby back to me, but I'm gonna, I'll see that baby t- tomorrow. I'll see him in the future I gotta, at some point in time. I'm just saying you can't spend your whole time moaning and crying about things that are temporary, that won't last. Handle it. Handle your business in the kingdom. Handle stuff that's, that's behind, that you messed up, you made some mistakes. Don't bury it like it didn't exist because it always exists. While you're burying it, there's angels down there digging it up like a, ooh, and they're putting it back in your record. If you've done good things, they're in your record. If you think nobody even appreciated what I've done, I'll never do that again. That's a trick of the demonic. Because what you've done is not recorded in the earth. You want what you've done to be recorded in the heavens. So that when the books are open and the book of your life is open, there's a story of you in the seventh grade and the eighth grade and the faithfulness that you've shown and the things that you've done. And then Jesus could say, yeah, yes, yes, well done, good, good job, hallelujah, praise God. You know why? Because he bled out for you. He was tortured for you to be a reflection of the living God, to bring it back. And the darkness would be cast out and the light would shine in an environment through your life like he has come as the light. And Jesus is there when they're examining going, yes, yes, well done, Will, way, yes. Come on. That's the path we're on. We don't want in that environment, there's like people saying, yeah, for like about 18 seconds. Hey, Betty's here. Hey. We want it to be like loud and boisterous. Some talked about the two halves of life. There's the first half. The first half is God's covenant with men, found in Isaiah 55. Let's. Let's go there, Isaiah 55. It's, God has made us a covenant, and, and in his covenant, there's, there's some things you should, you should rely on. Come, everyone who is thirsty. Come to the water, and you, you, without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. And wait a second. This is, how can I buy it if I don't have any resources? But God makes a way to restructure certain things in your life. Watch this. This is the first half. This is, the, this is Isaiah is giving us this principle that God has with Israel. God has made a covenant. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choices of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. I will make a permanent, a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindness of David, since I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the people. Now watch this. God says, because of David's faithfulness, I will I will bless Israel because he is a leader in Israel. Because faithful kindness makes a difference in the kingdom. I'm just saying, God's, God's going to bless your house and bless your family and bless those around you so that somebody who knows you has a, a smell of, of, of God's presence because you carry that fragrance. That kindness, that love, that they should they should get a flavor of that, and then and then here's the deal, everything then becomes free. Still, first half is free. How, how is that? How could it possibly free? Because it seems like now we still pay for everything. No, really, almost. If you understand it, you really don't pay for anything. God will provide it for you. He is a great provider. Our challenge is most of the time we rely on your own ability as a human when you need to rely on who you belong to in the heavens. 
Father. If you're in a place where you're needing something, Father. You're going on a journey, Father. You ought to start every part of that with a, a connection on your strongest connection, which who God is as your father. Don't, don't wait. This is early in my journey. I would wait till I couldn't do it anymore. Or I could, I'd exhausted all my options. I was now down at the ninth hour, and, in, and the waves of destruction were coming. And then I would cry out to the Lord, Father. All right. And, and part of that time, he would always deliver me, but part of the time, sometimes I was stung. I was stung in the fact that I waited so long that I just got brushed by it. I got brushed by the difficulty of the challenge. God would still make it work out for me in the long run. But I, I, would, I, I learned to stop waiting and start trusting earlier in the process. So when the challenge was coming, I started calling out to the Lord early. And then I learned as I grew, I started coming out to the Lord before the challenge appeared. I knew in the spirit a challenge was coming. And I would call out to the king early. Early in the morning while it was still dark. Jesus got up, went to a solitary place, and there he prayed. It's early. He'd get up, get out. Guys are still sleeping. He's talking to God. He's in the guy. He's with the guy that can provide everything at any time. He can do anything. And before you drop Jesus as the son of God portion, he didn't do that portion because he's the son of God. He did that portion because he's the son of man. He died on the cross and rose from the dead, son of God. Some of the things, though, is he's son of man. And that spirit's alive in you. Wake it up. Wake yourself up, man. It's your season. We need you to wake up. The world, your metron needs you to wake up. Need your kids to wake up. If you're going to slap your kids around, slap them around with kindness. I'm out kind, you boy. Get them. Go get them kids with kindness. Get them with mercy. Get them with love. All those, all those night, our first half, the first half experiences. You don't have to pay for that. It's free. You know, my boys have gotten a little, a little lazy, so, you know, I'm working on them to get them into church. And I told them, make sure, I got woke them up, make sure they're here for the second service. We'll see if they show up. Because I, I have practices that I learned from my mom. I, I, didn't, I didn't get up early and go to church. I, I mean, I did early when I was a kid. But then I got to an age where I didn't feel like I needed that. And, and I was cool like I was. It was all right. And so my mom would say, Gordy. She called me Gordy. She's the only one allowed. Gordy, Gordy, get up. Go to church. Get up. Get up. Yeah, yeah, Mom. Yeah, Mom. She said, you better get up, boy. I'm going to throw ice water on you. Ice water. You get up. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it, and uh, I'm trying to get into a deep sleep, and, and I'm thinking, what are the chances that she would actually throw ice water on me? She's going to soak the bed up. and what is she not going to do that? And I, I opened up one eye and, and saw the ice water coming towards me. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, she didn't do that that many times. That I, I got the message. I got it. So if you hear some screaming coming from Kent <laughs> on an early Saturday and Sunday morning, it's because ice water is being administered. <laughs> Isaiah 
gives us the word of this covenant that Israel has with God. And it's based on the faithful kindness of David. David is a great leader and consistently demonstrates the faithfulness of God. But Yeshua is going to take us to a higher place. Galatians 5.16 says, Then walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Now watch this. We still have this covenant with God, and, we're, and the Israelites are working to try to fulfill the covenant, to be part, to be, to, to be straight, to do their part, to, to, to be faithful, to, to give what, what needs to be given, to serve how, how they need to serve, to love how they need to love. And, and they're trying to do it the right way, but it's, it's, just, a, it's just a tough, it's a tough experience because they're human. They're like us. We're all human. And we have, we have good and bad that, that pushes out through our humanity. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. It's the first half. It's just a struggle. Maybe no one else has a struggle. Maybe, maybe you guys are all perfect and close to Jesus. Like when he breathes, you could feel his breath. I mean, for me, it's just a challenge. For the rest of us. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, verse 17, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. They are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. This is, this is how you live. This is humanity, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity. Idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions and drunkenness, enviness, dissensions and factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I remember the first time I read that. When I read that, I was, I think I was in, in, uh, in college. And I was practicing some of these things, not all of them, but I was practicing some of it. And then I got to that last line, the other than inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I was like, man, I got to clean up my life. But I had already built up a lot, some habits that were habits. So I had to say to the Lord, hey, break those. Break those. I'm just saying if you're doing things that are counterproductive to the things of God and you've buried some of them so that you don't even remember, but he remembers because there's a balance that comes in the kingdom when you exit the earth suit. And then you'll give an account. We want all the negative accounts to be crushed here on this side of the planet. It's in the first half. Listen, I'm just telling you what, you might think, look at that and say, I'm doing some of those things, it's bad news. No, it's not, it's not bad news, it's good news. It's good news that you're here and you're coming to terms with it. That's the good news. You can come to terms, good news, and Jesus will take it and wash it away so that it never existed. There's a balance in the kingdom. Now, if you think you're going to just bury it, and Jesus will never know. God will never know. He'll know. He already knows. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying some mistakes or failures of the past, you have to carry them the whole life. You don't have to carry them. You've got to confess them. And, talk, and transfer the weight of them from your ledger, which is way too weighty, to Jesus. Just give them to Jesus. You got some mistakes you've made, give them to Jesus. Some things that you've done you shouldn't have done, give them to Jesus. I'm just going to cover them. I just don't want to face it. Stop it. Everybody already knows. Just give it to Jesus. 
Now, don't give it to Jesus and keep doing them. Give them to Jesus and ask Jesus, listen, for the power to stop. First time I read it, I said, well, wow, I got to stop. So I tried to stop. And I was still, I'd stop pretty much. But I still have a little stream of stupidity in a college kid. And then I said to the Lord, I really need help doing this. Because I can't do this on my own. It's amazing how powerful the Holy Spirit is. He comes and flips my life. Changes my life. And then my friends would come, and I would say, no, I don't, I don't do that any longer. No, I don't, I don't go there any longer. No, that's, that's a thing of the past in my life. And then it became such a pattern that the, God started putting people around me that followed that same pattern to the point that guys would say, well, how long has it been since you stopped doing that? He said, yesterday. But he would talk like it was like 20 years ago, dark when, you know. But he just caught it. I'm just telling you, Yeshua has bled out for you and completely er erased everything on your record that was counter to being a reflection of him. Live that. Here's the second half, the half that we're closing with. This is the half that we live now. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Again, in Galatians chapter, chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the produce of the Spirit. This is, this is the Spirit of God. This, is, this Spirit lives in your house. It, lives, it, it, it rides with you to work. It, it, this Spirit engages your spouse and, and your children, and your children engage you. This is, this is the Spirit in which you function in the workplace. You function in your community. This is the spirit in which your metron is, is formed and, and fashioned into. So if there's things in your metron, your measure of rule that you don't like, send a different spirit in the second half so it can change it. And your, your fears, your, your emotions, your doubts, your worries, fashion this, that with a new spirit and a new thought and a new word and a new behavior. This is the fruit of the spirit is, is love. The first produce that the Spirit's going to produce is love. Listen, not, not necessarily love for somebody else, but you got to find out some love for you. If you don't love you, how are you going to give that to anybody else? Nobody wants your self-temporary, self-judgment. Half the time you love me, the other half the time you hate me. i got to do everything perfect. Before you, before you accept me. And I'm always on the edge. That's not love. That's not love. Love is this. <sighs> you just made a stupidest decision. Hey, come here. He said, well, somebody's got to correct him. The correction is coming. Don't worry about correction. There's some self-correction already built into the kingdom of God. You're not going to get away with anything. So God knows that judgment will take its place. It will fit into the spot it needs to fit in. The fruit, though, of the Spirit, the produce of the Spirit is love. Love brings joy. And joy has a partner called peace. Those are the three dominant characteristics in the kingdom of God. How you know somebody's walking in the kingdom when there's love, there's joy in their heart, and there's peace. If you don't have those, you need to ask him. If those three characteristics visit but don't live there, invite them. Make a room for them. Give them a seat at the table. Help them measure the shows that you're watching and the stuff you're taking into your, into your spirit and into your soul. If you're watching horror movies and you wonder why you're always afraid, 
Hello. I like horror movies. No, you don't. Or else you, are, you are, wouldn't be afraid all the time. Stop it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, help me, gentleness, and self-control. You know, that's, the, that's the, the maturation of the Spirit. You know that you're mature in the Spirit when that last one is in your life. Self-control. The ability to control you. It's just the hardest one to, ta- to master. The law is not against such things. Now, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. Just the second half of life. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's walk with the Spirit. Let the Spirit walk you home and walk you to school and, and, and do things for you and open up doors and give you a bonus or raise and and then you take the bonus and raise and you give it away. And you're like, oh, that's crazy. Why would I want to give it away? Because the Spirit has directed you. Because you understand that in the Spirit there is no limits. So you give a little small thing and it's a seed. You're just planting a seed. You don't eat the seeds that are designed for planting. You plant the seeds that are designed for planting. So if the Spirit gives you something to plant, Plant it. Don't eat it. Because if you plant it, it will multiply. If you eat it, yeah, you might enjoy the moment, but it won't be eternal. It won't be things that are rolled back all the time. Yeah. Uh, so you sign fine favor. There's that's looking at her watch as if she's saying, did you just look at your watch on me, girl? Huh? <laughs> I'm keenly aware it's 1026. (laughs) Now, if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It's not His way. It's not our way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God's making a way. God's making a way. God's making a way. You know, I'm, you know, I mess with Deer Zed a lot. You know, I mess with Deer Zed a lot because we're bonded. If I wasn't bonded to her and she wasn't bonded to me, I wouldn't say a third of the things that I say. Well, maybe not a third, but. (laughs) But we are bonded. She knows I give my life for her and vice versa. You need to have that bond with Yeshua and have that bond with your children. And have that bond with your spouse. And have that bond with your coworkers. And each each bond is different. The bond that I have with our with my kids is different than the bond that I have with my wife. It's a different bond, but it still is a bond. The bond I have with Yeshua, my bond with Jesus, who's given his life for me, and I've given my life for him, is different than my bond with my family. It's a different bond. I'm just saying, you got to create bonds in your life and, and, and places that God walks with you and you walk with him. And, and then the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit, the produce of God is manifested in your life. It's in, and it grows in your house. And it grows, it grows at the workplace. It grows in your community. And, and it becomes part of what you say and how you say it and what you do and how you do it. And then you become a leader in the kingdom with overnight. It's almost just a shift. He's, and there's people around you that are looking for your voice. You don't have to search for them. 
push it through social media so that you get a following. Following will come. That, that, that false following, it won't, it won't transfer into the kingdom of God if you're not using that to bring people into the kingdom. It won't transfer. They'll just all be selfish about you. You'll try to distance yourself from it, but it'll trail you. I'm saying if it's not for Yeshua, it's not for the king, if it's not changing lives, it's not worthy of being attached to you in the future. Father, we just thank you that what you have determined will be established from beginning to end. We are your sons and daughters who belong to you. And we are faithful to you in all of our ways. Bless us and strengthen us so that our voices are powerful voices in the earth. Help us to control our words and our voice so that we do the things that are, we're called to do. Mm. I thank God for you. You're one of the great people in the kingdom of God. You have honor before your King Jesus. You'll have great honor, greater honor in the kingdom of heaven. Sealed and settled in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen.